Hey, welcome back to the Two Super Guys Trade Stocks. I am Dylan. And I'm Vinny. And today we're going to talk about Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger, a couple of the OGs in value investing. They had their annual meeting last week. I'm going to give you some of the highlights from my listening to it and kind of things that I thought were interesting. We're going to get to it. <laughs> Two stupid guys trade stocks. So, as you can imagine, based upon you know headlines over the last like say six months, right? Banking crisis was something they got a few questions about, and they were asking about Buffett's take as a bank investor and kind of what he thought about this whole crisis. And particularly, someone asked him about the SVB failure, and he said if the FDIC hadn't come in and eliminated that cap, it would have been catastrophic for the U.S. banking sector. Right. Yeah, I mean, it, I don't think they would have let that happen. Also, all the people that would have lost money, venture capitalists, I mean, they, it would have been spiraled into other areas other than banking. I mean, that exactly. Yeah, so and many jobs. He used that to kind of touch on upon the debt ceiling here. He's like, because that's the current trend, right? Everyone's talking about, oh, the debt ceiling, you know, Janet Yellen gave a date of June 1st. We're shooting this in May here. You know, will they reach a deal? He, no. he, he basically is saying, like, it's just another fear mongering thing. People are just worried about it, but eventually a deal will be reached. You cannot, cannot let this happen where you allow, you know, banks to fail and, and depositors to lose their money. You cannot allow the U.S. government to basically default on its debts because that's what happens here. But this is too valuable, too important that a deal will be made. Right? This is just so the financial sector of each like website, like CNBC, can have something to talk about for a week. There's, there's no actual risk. Exactly. That's what he said. Messaging has been poor by the media and politicians. No one has come out with any authority, really, and said just like, you know what? This this is not going to happen. We're not going to let 2008 happen again. We're, we're literally going to you know break anything and you know do whatever we need to do in order to make like the, the economy function for everyone. That is literally like the, the tacit promise that should exist and really probably does. It's just that you know no one comes out and says that because they want to just fear monger and put a bunch of flames in the thumbnails yeah guilty right here <laughs> oh do we have flames right. on ours oh yeah i mean you should always have flames in your thumbnails it works like 95 oh, percent cool. of the time sweet <laughs> um but this was an interesting one that like you know one of the things dylan and i were looking at the whole banking sector from was like can we find good deals and someone asked buffett about investing in banks and he said because of the fact that it's news driven now and what politicians decide are really going to shape the future returns for banks that the bank returns are just too unpredictable now it's wild huh so th they're talking about as a whole not like regional banks as a whole just the banking sector in general it's too hard to predict what the returns for will be in banking because of the fact that they're going to be news cycle driven more than they are actually the fundamentals of the business yeah but how many billions of dollars does munger and buffett have in bac True, very true. Uh, he, he has sold some other banking stocks over the you know last few years. I mean, he even owned Citigroup at one point in time. Um, but you know, in, in general, I don't think he's going to see any large uh, kind of acquisitions of, of banking stock in the Munger Berkshire you know kind of portfolios. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. This this is became it was just funny. This was like a little joke. It was such a such a kind of joke for them as far as like talking about the banking cycle. They literally had these signs made just to throw them out there and be kind of funny about it. He flips them over at one point in the meeting, uh, talking about you know he's available for sale and Munger is held to maturity. <laughs> held to maturity. I like he's got the coke on the table too. Oh yeah, of course, man. Cherry coke, you know, product placement. Oh, this little brown thing you're seeing right here, by the way, that's a box of C's peanut brittle, uh, the company that they own. He's, he's uh, not, uh, you know, he's shameless about his product placements, if you will. <laughs> so, you know, because of Berkshire's size and particularly they have a fair amount of subsidiaries, you know, a lot of different sectors, but a lot of housing related stuff, too. So they talked about like the incredible period for housing and how it's come to an end. How six months ago, it didn't matter what product was. If you had a product that was roughly akin to what someone was looking for, they bought it. And there were no sales necessary, nothing. They were buying full price all the time. But now, you know, some of our subsidiaries got caught with a little bit of an inventory glut because they had been ordering literally everything they could get their hands on, and now they have a little bit too much. So they're having to do, kind of move towards sales in order to clear that out. But the silver lining is the fact that Berkshire holds a lot of cash, right? And now you look at treasury yields. He talked about buying, I think, a two-year treasury at 5.9% uh, that he just bought $3 billion worth of the other day. Yeah, so, it, it's disgusting. The amount that cash can make right now is wild. Yeah. So he said... A couple of years ago, they were making $50 million a year on their cash pile, right? He said now they're expected to produce about $5 billion in the next year just on interest on their cash pile. Yeah, that's disgusting. That's crazy. Man. <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, their operating earnings were, I think, $9 billion or something like that for this quarter, $30 billion per year. So they're going to be generating like, all, you know, almost a, a half a quarter in interest earnings compared to the actual running of the business itself. <laughs> I mean, that's it, it's a guaranteed opportunity, right? And the stock market itself, it's kind of, I just don't know where it's going because it really seems like it should go down, but it keeps on going up. So then, you know, if you just hold cash, you're guaranteed a large amount if you're that. Yeah, 5.9% on $3 billion, That's a lot of money. So, you know, this is a common theme, right? And Dylan and I have had this discussion before about whether or not value investing is dead. So someone flat out asked him this question. And he goes, uh, this is a great line. He goes, what gives you opportunities is other people doing dumb things, right? And then he continues, in the 58 years of been running Berkshire, there's been a great increase in the number of people doing dumb things. <laughs> Thanks to Robin Hood. There we go. See, shout exactly. out. Exactly. You know, he talked a little bit about the kind of insurance sector and how, like, you know, the companies like Lemonade, which have raised a bunch of capital and come to market, and none of them can make a profit. He was like, we started um, General RE or, uh, with, with a Jit Jane, who was like their, their head of... Um, kind of insurance he's like this this unit didn't exist 12 years ago and now it's profitable and one of the largest like general reinsurers in the world <laughs> yeah you know? there's well i'm you know a lot of businesses went away in 2020 but now there's like a lot of a lot of people that are getting funding prior to that that are just not surviving it's just it's mm -hmm. not great yeah, that's what his point well, kind of was as far as that goes. As far as AI, which I thought was a really funny question to ask a couple of guys in their 90s oh, yeah, about great. AI, like um, groundbreaking leading technology. Uh, this was Charlie Munger. I think old-fashioned intelligence works very well. <laughs> okay, classic, classic. And then Buffett went on to say, he's like, the problem with AI is we won't be able to uninvent it. He goes, you know, he was talking about it's useful. He said Bill Gates had given him like a private tour of some of like, the more cutting edge stuff that Microsoft was working on. Um, he goes, but he's like, you know, for a very good reason, we did invent the atom bomb at the time and then we can't uninvent these things. Right. That's and he a said, surprisingly intelligent like view of looking at it for a 90 year old man, 93 yeah. year old man. Yeah. And then he went on to kind of paraphrase this Einstein quote talking about how AI can change everything in the world except for how men think, right? which is uh, interesting. Ultimately, okay. it'll be, uh, you know, a, a kind of a human element that brings a power, uh, like a, a failure, if any. You know, like there's that great chart about how many times AI has been mentioned throughout corporate earnings in the last quarter. And it's, it's obviously gone up a lot, but, you know, it's not, I don't know how, how profitable it really will be, how earth changing it really will be no one knows that's what he said he's like you know you don't can't predict 200 years from now what, what this technology is going to have because we just can't uninvent it let it out of the box and we see what happens yeah um, I'm, but, i think like 70 years ago we, we were all supposed to have flying cars and now yeah. we have one day delivery still cool still but cool. you know but i will say the munger's comment is what you would think from like a, a kind of like 90 year old really really intelligent guys buffett's is more what i would think tests like elon would say true true yeah i mean you know buffett does definitely have a little kind of pulse i guess of more modern technology through his friendship with bill gates a little bit uh so you, you know he got kind of a preview of something that probably isn't available publicly yet right true chat gpt folks you know they asked him about his uh, taiwan semiconductor sale actually i thought you might find this one interesting and he said he loved the business you know he said it's going to do very well for the next five ten years but he hated the location so Buffett just decided to stay away from the Taiwan kind of China, you know, kind of potential there. I guess you go risk it factor, if you will. Uh, so he just decided it wasn't worth his time. You know, that $5 billion investment, they sold it all pretty much the next quarter. So there are Taiwan semiconductors in other locations. I mean, there's some in Arizona. Yeah. He, he even touched on that. One of their units, uh, one of their construction units, I guess, is actually working on that, uh, one of the facilities in Arizona. Um, but just in general, I mean, imagine how much of the company valuation would be destroyed if there were to be oh, a, yeah. No, that's true. Yeah, offensive military operation in, in Taiwan. If you So that makes sense, I think. And then he talked about Japan just kind of feeling like a better risk reward ratio for him at this point in time. Um, they, they were doing some investing in Japan. I get exactly what, what industry. And Munker kind of got into this too. <laughs> Although no one asked him specifically about Alibaba, but he just talked about the fact that this ongoing U.S.-China escalation in terms of what's the word I want to say here? Um, competitiveness. Dick how measuring. Really, oh, sorry. Yes. Yeah, dick measuring. Yes. Yeah. How we would be much better off if we just got along. 
but never will that happen. And Buffett was actually more the realist on this one where he was like, you know, you, you can have rules to a certain degree, but you're always going to be trying to push the other guy to the limit. Uh, and it's like a game theory thing going on between the U.S. and China, and that's what's going to continue to happen. Yeah, I don't see that changing anytime soon. I do agree. It's not beneficial for anybody. Yeah. And then if someone asked me about electric vehicles, you know, Buffett's been kind of very vocal about this for a while. It's just because it's great technology does not mean it's a great investment. And th this next one just made me laugh out loud. Uh, Buffett was like, yeah, I was recently reading the GM annual report from 1932. <laughs> like, what the fuck is wrong yeah, with this baller thing to say okay yeah yeah like well, did you get this on like on a slate like how how did, how did this arrive to you yeah, that's wild, dude. <laughs> telegraph um but you're saying how at the time gm had like eighteen thousand dealers in the united states and now all told all brands in the united states have about nineteen thousand dealers so the, just to show how unpredictable it was despite the fact that the car was like truly earth changing from 1932 to now you know you've had a tremendous impact but yet the number of dealers actually went down significantly. Yeah. I will say uh, that may be due to capitalism and not like, you know, cause you're same with banks. We had like 15,000 banks around that time and now we have 4,000 ish. Something like that, yeah. We've lost like over 10,000 banks over the last like 15 years. Yeah. So Dylan, this is a big one for you. Uh, he didn't directly say it. He said, we only will say what's in the 13 F filing. The 13F filing should be out this week for Berkshire. However, they did ask him about the UK blocking the AT, uh, Activision Blizzard deal. And he said Microsoft and Activision have done everything in their power to alleviate any concerns. And if it doesn't get approved, it won't be because of lack of effort. However, if you look at the 13Q, you can see that they sold a little bit over $9 billion in stocks. They, their Berkshire, I mean, their Activision Blizzard position was like $4.2 billion or something like that. So it, they very well could have liquidated their position. We won't know until like this week. We'll find out. Can I guess? Um, yeah. Okay. So, because this is what I wish I did. One, I bought in at, um, I think it, my average was 72.80 or 73. And I, I got out at 78 after the thing came out. So I still made a small profit. But they there was a rumor or news, and it's literally, you know, sell the news. I don't know why I didn't do this. I just like, oh, just a little bit more percent. The fucking greedy asshole of my head was like, hold on. But basically, they were at 75 bucks. They gapped up to 85 because rumors came out that um, the deal was imminent. It's all going to go well. It was hanging around there for, you know, days. I can't remember. Um, and then it came out. No, it didn't. They went, went right back down to like 78. Now they're at like 75. Um, wow. He probably sold during that. I would guess he probably sold a decent amount of shares at 85. Because what you should do in that situation is sell half. Just yeah. take the gains, sell half. Because you don't actually know if it's going to work. Sure, it'll jump up to, I don't remember the strike, 94 or something? 95, I think. 95. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, could have had a lot more profit, but didn't do it right. Yeah, and he was buying before that deal was announced. So his cost basis is even lower than yours. Yeah. So, yeah. so for him, it wouldn't even make sense. It was like another $10. But I think his cost basis was like 62 or something. Yeah. I'm not sure, but it, yeah, it was, it was pre the, the announcement of the deal was when he was acquiring Activision Blizzard shares, and he, he did actually add more after that. But um, yeah, so I, I, we'll, we'll see. That'll be something I have to pay attention to this week. Will that cause you, you know, like so? You have no position left at no. all in Activision Blizzard. As soon as that came out, I I exited. I got like six percent or something. I can't remember what it was. Seven percent. I just left. Yeah. It's not worth it because now I'm holding on to. I would have to go off the basis that it fails and. That's too much for Activision Blizzard only. I would like to own them in the 50s, not in yeah. the 70s. Okay. You, you made several Chipotle burritos out of that deal, though, so that's hard to argue with. Yeah, yeah, I did. I did. I did. That's fair. That makes you feel better. Thank you. <laughs> All right, guys. We'll catch you in the next one. Let us know what you think about the uh, annual meeting from Berkshire Hathaway down below in the comments.